I was a, a graduate student here in 1962 uh, for a few more years, and then I was uh, part of the, uh, I think it was neurobiology training program for a summer. And then I left uh, the United States for a couple of years and was at the Marine, the laboratory of the Marine Biological Association in Plymouth, England, where I continued uh, working on uh, uh, squid. And um, then I came back to the United States and I started coming here as a principal investigator, probably in the summer of 1969. And uh, more or less every summer since then, I was... Uh, I came here, and uh, I grew up uh, in Indiana, and I went to university at the University of Chicago, and then a graduate student at Columbia, and then I was a postdoc at, in the Institute of Animal Physiology in Babram, Cambridge, England. And, uh, well, I've been a scientist for uh, <laughs> for about 55 or 60 years, and I'm still enjoying it. And it, it's, uh, for me, it was a great career. And uh, part, of the, part of the greatness was uh, that I could come here, because here, there, here at the MBL in the summers, there were a lot of really smart scientists and uh, serious scientists. And... Uh, it was really nice to interact with them. So the, the being here at the MBL was uh, part of what made my career such a happy career, such a good career. And I would say that I became interested in, um, in biology because of a high school biology teacher. And, uh, and I went off to... Uh, University of Chicago, and I wasn't so clear about whether I wanted to be a biologist or a physicist, and uh, I took uh, the first year physics course, and uh, I couldn't get an A no matter how hard I tried, and I decided I should be a biologist, and there I was, <laughs> and it, it was a good match. Uh, I don't think my brain was that, would have been that good for physics. No, um, no scientists. Um, all of my grandparents were immigrants from Eastern Europe, so, so they had no idea about science, and uh, my parents were not scientists, and uh, none of my siblings, but my, uh, I have two sons and a daughter, and the daughter is, uh, she likes science, but she doesn't like the idea of having to write grants, so... Uh, I was a graduate student with uh, Teru Hayashi, and uh, the, the, probably the most important thing was he had a laboratory in Lilly that overlooked the tennis court. So he could know when the tennis court was free, and he could run down and play tennis. And uh, he was a muscle physiologist, and at, the, at that time, there was Albert St. Georgie here, who was a Nobel Prize winner and a very famous muscle physiologist, and Albert's uh, nephew, Andrew St. Georgie. So it was a pretty s strong place in uh, muscle physiology, and that's what I kind of did for my uh, graduate school thesis. So it was a good place then, and then uh, uh, I kind of ran out of, I, I didn't have any clever ideas about what to do in muscle, so then I um, said, oh, I'm going to do learning. And then uh, I didn't know anything about learning, so I went and talked to some people, and they said, go to, and I said, I want to go to Europe, and they said, go to this lab, or this lab, or this lab, and I contacted those labs, and uh, one was, uh, the one at the top of the list was Alan Hodgkin. He, he won a Nobel Prize. He said no. The next on the list was uh, Bernard Katz. He won a Nobel Prize. He said, come in one year. Third on the list was Richard Keynes, uh, um, the nephew of Maynard Keynes, the economist. Anyhow, 
Richard Keynes said to come, so I went to Keynes's lab. Yeah, he was a he was a very supportive PI, and uh, one month every year, the whole month, he came to the lab every day, and uh, we did experiments together every day for a month every year. So I got a, a real mentoring about doing experiments, and uh, he was really good to me. He helped me get job, get a job. He helped some of my postdocs get a job. Good guy. He died about two or three years ago. Well, what I really like a lot is the, is the scientists that are here that come in the summer. The MBL doesn't have a big neuroscience, year-round neuroscience program, but the summer neuroscience program is really good. A lot of scientists. I like that. And uh, I like that um, there are a goodly number of serious scientists who are here for the summer. And so it's not all uh, careerist. There's, um, they're actually interested in science and in the answer to scientific questions. So, and, and they're smart, a lot of them are smarter than I am, and so it makes it a pleasure to be here. One of the things that happened in my career was, uh, was for the first 20 or 30 years, the experiments were all done here at the MBL, and then the winter time was spent analyzing the experiments. So maybe that was more fun being here, doing experiments. And back at, at Yale, it was, uh, you know, an, analyzing, which isn't bad, but then there was grant writing and dealing with, uh, you know, animal care protocols and things like that. So it was kind of more fun to be here. To me, the, the, the one of the valuable aspects is that the MBL uh, makes it easy to collaborate because they, they you can, person X from uh, Trieste and, and Y from Chile wants to come do an experiment uh, with me. And uh, here, the, they, they can find housing and um, um, they feel welcome and they're part of the community and uh, um, it, it just makes it easy to collaborate. So that's a, a big uh, benefit. And the other is that uh, three or four nights a week there are seminars in my subject. And uh, so I get to hear a lot of science and I get to talk to a lot of scientists. And uh, that's another really good thing about it, and um, a thing which, uh, which probably isn't spoken about too often, but the postdocs in my lab benefit from coming here because they get to meet a lot of scientists and get to hear about a lot of new science. So for them, uh, it may be even a bigger benefit than for me because they wouldn't have the opportunity to meet all these people and talk to them and chat with them. Uh, back at Yale, and particularly not in Seoul, because uh, not that many people come through Seoul. Not that many neuroscientists come, come by. Here it's uh, maybe 75 famous neuroscientists come here every summer to teach in the courses, it's really good. Sort of the main interest is, uh, for the last 50 years, has been how does the brain work? And then uh, you discover people don't really know how it works. And you discover they know really very little about how it works. And, um, but even though they don't know much, and it's difficult to learn uh, a lot, and um, uh, still, it's, it's still very interesting and challenging subject and uh, for example seems more interesting and challenging than learning how muscle contracts because they kind of know a lot about that how it, 
So that's not so much fun anymore. But they don't know a lot about how how brains work. So that's really uh, it's really interesting and it's challenging and uh, and you know that you're going to die before they solve it and then you you know that uh, you're not going to know whether you made a good contribution or you led people down the wrong path. So it's uh, it's exciting that way. Yeah, that you won't know. You work all your life and you won't know. I like sitting out on the bench in front of uh, Roll or what used to be called Whitman. So you could sit there for lunch and sit and chat with uh, a bunch of people who like sitting on that bench. And uh, then you would also chat with passerbys. And uh, <laughs> that, was re that was really good. By having people for dinner, Ten times a summer, I would have postdocs and other labs come for dinner. And uh, so uh, in 2014, I wanted to get a DNA from a man named, named Miyawaki, who was a famous scientist in Japan. So I said, OK, I'll write him an email. And then somebody else told me he's not going to answer. So I wrote him an email, and he answered. And he says, oh, I'm really happy to uh, provide you with the DNA. And I remember I came to dinner at your house in 1990. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, I'm glad I had him for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, you, there are these uh, unexpected benefits. This last five years has been uh, scientifically very successful. I answered a question I didn't know I could answer. I thought it was an interesting question, half important. And uh, I answered it, and uh, I used a, a sort of a new method for answering it that would allow other people to answer the same question elsewhere in the brain. And so that made me happy. And, uh, So the question I answered was, uh, what does this brain structure contribute to our perception? And it was ab about the olfactory bulb, and it's about our perception of odors. And I said, and I did, I, well, actually, uh, Doug Storis did uh, an experiment and showed that it contributed uh, to the perception that uh, a dilute odor smells like the same odor as a concentrated odor. So if you, uh, somebody makes popcorn down the hall, it's popcorn. No trouble recognizing it, but it's going to be dilute when it gets, the odor is going to be dilute when it gets to your nose. And in contrast, when you have popcorn in your hand, then it's right under your nose. It's going to be, the odor is going to be concentrated, but you still recognize it. And so uh, the question is, where in the brain is this concentration invariance of the perception worked out? And we were able to show that one of the places that it's worked out is in the olfactory bulb. So then, but the olfactory bulb sends its output to 12 other places in the brain. So there are other aspects of olfactory perception that occur elsewhere. And nobody knows exactly what those other 12 places do. And uh, that was, uh, that's kind of interesting. I used to tell people that I was overpaid and over-admired. <laughs> that makes for a happy career, right? <laughs> if you're underpaid and under-admired, you're going to be kind of bitter. And uh, if you're overpaid and over-admired, then it's been a good career.